Hello. Hi, my name is Benjamin Tan and I work at Neo. So this guy is Tim O'Reilly. He's the same guy behind all the O'Reilly books. So he once gave a talk titled Watching the Alpha Geeks. In it, he said, and I quote, this is how we get most of our good ideas at O'Reilly. We look at people who seem to be doing magic and we ask them how they do it. There always, there always seems to be people in any field that seems to be the most clued in to the deepest trends, who seem to be playing with all the coolest stuff and have their finger in everything before even anyone knows about it. That was what I was observing when I was playing around with Elixir. So, this is Jose Valim. You might know him from his Rails contributions and gems such as Device. But nowadays, he's also known as the creator of Elixir, a new programming language built on the Erlang virtual machine. <laughs> so, a couple of months ago, Jose did a peep quote screencast. A couple of weeks after that, books started pouring out. The Pragmatic um, Bookshelf did a book, Manning did a book, and also um, the O'Reilly guys did a book. So, this is Dave Thomas. You might know him. He is one of the guys behind Pragmatic Publishing. So, Dave has always been an advocate for Ruby and for Rails. In fact, he is often credited as one of the guys who brought Ruby into the English-speaking world. But nowadays, he's doing the same thing for Elixir. So, this is Joe Armstrong. This is one of the inventors of Erlang. He wrote about his one-week experience with Elixir. And suffice to say, it is safe to say that he liked it. So, what the heck was going on? The language hasn't even hit 1.0 yet. Yet, there was all these smart people raving about this language. So, I decided to investigate. So, the more I played with Elixir, the more I liked it. I was hooked. So, a polyglot is somebody who knows and can use multiple languages. Similarly, a polyglot programmer can use multiple programming languages. So this talk, I want to encourage you to look beyond Ruby. I won't try to convert you away from Ruby because that would be a huge mistake coming to RubyConf and doing that kind of stunt. <laughs> but I might persuade you to add Elixir into your toolset. So what is Elixir and what exactly makes it special? Elixir is a functional, meta programming aware language that builds on top of the Erlang virtual machine. It focuses on tooling to leverage Erlang's capabilities to build um, fault-tolerant, concurrent, and distributed applications. So, one of the reasons I was attracted to Elixir is because of its concurrency, because it is a concurrency-oriented language. So, the main concurrency primitive in Elixir is the process. The process is not like the process we are used to in operating systems. Instead, the all processors in Elixir are controlled by the Erlang virtual machine. Elixir pro programmers create processors just like Ruby programmers create objects. In fact, a single Erlang virtual machine can support up to 13 million processors. So, Elixir processors can run on a single CPU and across multiple CPUs with very little overhead. Here, we have a uniprocessor machine with a single Erlang virtual machine. But if we have multi-processor hardware, the Erlang runtime can distribute all the workload across all the CPU cores without any changes in the program. The only way to communicate between processors is through sending and receiving of messages. As long as you know the process ID, you can send a process a message. And this is an important point. A process A cannot modify the memory of process B directly. The only way to potentially do that is to send it a message. So, messages are sent asynchronously, much in a fire and forget fashion. <laughs> I love that. So, we will see this in action soon. This is the Ackermann function. The function takes in two arguments, m and n, both of which must be more than zero. The first two cases are pretty straightforward, but I would like to draw your attention to the third case. If you look at the third case in the second argument, it's a recursive call to itself. So this makes the entire computation stack grow really quickly and makes for a very nice and computationally intensive example. So 
This is the Ackermann function written in Elixir. Elixir programs are generally organized in modules, and within them are function clauses. This is a full program with an additional loop function. What this loop function does is, when you execute the loop function in a process, it enables the process to receive and send messages. Let's see how we can do that. So first, to create a process, we use the built-in spawn function, which takes in three arguments. First, the module name, the function name, and then a list of arguments. So since we are not passing in any arguments to loop, we simply pass in an empty list. The return value of the spawn function is the process ID, which is what, how we reference the process. Now, once we return from here, our process is ready to send and receive messages. To send a message a process, rather, to send, yeah, to send a message to a process, we use the built-in send function. So send takes in two arguments, the process ID and the message. The kinds of messages that a process can handle is declared within the receive block. If the pattern of the message matches those patterns defined in the receive block, then we execute the body. On the other hand, if the message doesn't match any pattern, we will simply try on the next pattern and so on and so forth. So in this example, we are sending a two element tuple and it matches the first case. Therefore, the result will be computed. So, once the computation is done, the loop function calls itself again in a tail recursive call. So, in Elixir, looping is done via recursion and it's a very common design pattern. This is needed because we want the process to be able to receive multiple messages. If, if we don't do, without the loop, the process will simply exit and then will be garbage collected. So, here I want to show you how we can run um, functions directly. That is, we are now not running functions in the process. So for simple computations such as like Ackermann 3.2, it will probably return immediately. But if you try anything more computationally intensive such as um, 4.1, the process will be blocked for 60 seconds. So in this case, the shell is blocked and you can't do anything for like around a minute. So things get a little more fun now. We are going to create a process with spawn. This time, we're going to send the process the exact same messages as we did in the previous example. So here we have created a process. And notice that the, once we send a message over, the first thing we get back is the message and then the result. But now if we send something more complicated, we only get back the message. We still have to wait about around 60 seconds to get back the result, but the caller isn't blocked. When we send a message anything other than a two element tuple, we will fall back to the second pattern which matches anything. So let's take things up a notch. We are going to start up four processors and give each of these four processors a computationally intensive task to handle. So here we are creating four separate processors. We place them in a list and then run each of them through a map function. Of which we send the message 4.3 to each of these processes. So notice how the activity monitor lights up on all four cores. So while, it's run, while four processes are running in the background, we can go ahead and create another process, send it in another message. But notice that if we were to send a process to a busy message, all the messages are being buffered. So Elixir has also baked in features that makes it easy to build fault-tolerant programs. Fault tolerance in this context means having the system to stay up despite failure. So, let it crash is part of the Erlang philosophy. In general, defensive programming is frowned upon. You are going to screw up eventually and your code is go going to have bugs. Instead of trying to fix all the corner cases, have a process, watch over another process. If the process fails, just let somebody else take over. 
One of the fault tolerance features of Elixir comes in the form of supervisors. The supervisor's only job is to monitor child processes. So supervisors can be layered, which means that supervisors can take care of other supervisors. This allows us to create layered architecture and so that we can even create a bigger supervision tree. When a child process dies, the supervisor can react in a number of ways. For example, it can simply restart the child, or it can terminate all the child processes under the tree and have it restart all over again. So I'm going to show you a demo here where how to see how a supervisor restarts a cute child process. So over here, the red balls are unnamed processors. The blue balls are named processors. The green stuff you can pretty much ignore. So this is all the processors which are start up in the Elixir system. So I've started 50 processors, which, are hand, which is handled by the supervisor at the middle. So I'm going to turn off the labels for now. And now I'm going to kill all the workers. So notice the moment I kill all the workers, the supervisor simply restarts all the workers again. So at this point of time, there are around 200 workers. And again, I'm going to issue the kill command to every single process. Watch how the supervisor restarts everything. The next thing I want to showcase is distributed elixir, which is, I think, one of the more fun features the Erlang virtual machine gives us. The Erlang VM makes connecting nodes a pretty trivial affair. Processes in a cluster are said to be location transparent. This means that sending messages between pr processors in a local machine is just as easy as sending messages on a remote node. So over here, we have a five node cluster consisting of one server node and four worker nodes. The purpose of this distributed system, which I'm going to demo next, is to discover for prime numbers. Here's an example of how the messages get passed between the worker processors and the server. First, the worker will request a number to the server. The server will re respond with a number. Then, upon receiving the number, the worker will go ahead and check to see whether the number is prime or not. If it's prime, it will reply to the server, yes, this is a prime number or no, this is not a prime number. The server has two jobs. The first job of the server is to remember the highest prime number it has discovered so far. The second thing it should do is to respond from the worker and hand it out a number when the worker requests for it. So this back and forth messaging can happen between multiple processors and spanning multiple nodes. The beauty of this is that the server and the worker nodes do not have to be on the same computer. Let's see a demo. So in this example, I'm going to set up a three node cluster. So as long as you know the name and IP address of the computer, it's pretty easy to set up. So here, I'm going to issue a command which allows each node to look at its neighbors. And just like that, we have a three node cluster. Next, I'm going to run the server on the top left hand side and worker processes on the remaining nodes. So what you see here are the workers already computing for and checking for prime numbers. We can go ahead and start a couple more processes across both nodes. So here we are going to stop one of the nodes, but notice that the server just continues chugging along and, and the other worker is not even affected. After that, we can go on and connect back the node to, 
for that node to join back the rest of the cluster. And we can go ahead and spawn a couple more workers. So another fun thing is I'm now going to connect the Raspberry Pi to a cluster. And so now it can also take part in the discovery of prime numbers. So here I'm going to SSH into the Raspberry Pi. I've already installed Erlang on it. We connect to the cluster. And on the Raspberry Pi, we just start a couple of processors. Basically, everything runs the same way. So now I want to introduce to you my all-time favorite programming operator, the pipe. Jose stole the pipe from the F-sharp people. What it does is to pipe the value of the left-hand side and pipe it into the first argument of the function on the right-hand side. This operator alone changes the way you think about programming. It encourages you to think about programming as a series of trans data transformation using multiple functions. Let me show you an example. Here's one way to write this function over here. We have a sequence of numbers 1 to 10, we apply map on it, multiply it by 2, and finally, we reverse the entire sequence. But notice, to understand this function, you have to look from inside out in, under, in order to understand this function. Here's the same function, but expressed using the pipe operator. We pipe the sequence into the map function, multiply it by 2, and pipe that result back into the reverse function. Again, data transformation in a series of functions. I think that looks way prettier. So we've come to the last bit. Hopefully, I've managed to convince you that Elixir is pretty awesome. And now we're going to see how we can use Elixir in our Ruby projects. For that, I'm going to use Rails and Sidekick. For those who are not familiar with Sidekick, it describes itself as a simple and efficient background job processor in, for Ruby. Before we start messing around with Sidekick, let's try to understand a little what goes on underneath the hood. Here's a slightly simplified version of how Sidekick works. So the first step is to write the worker and store it in the apps slash worker directory. Then we have to include the Sidekick worker module, and then we implement the perform method. To call the worker, we execute the perform async method in your controllers with the appropriate arguments. What the Sidekick client does is it creates a JSON hash containing information such, such as the job ID, the class, the arguments, and other things. This is the information needed to execute the worker code in a thread. Sidekick has a polar which pulls for a Redis queue for any new jobs. If there is one, it is popped off by the queue by the queue, or rather, it is popped off the queue by the polar. Finally, Sidekick will then examine the hash and execute the appropriate worker in a thread. But here's the thing, you can really write workers in any language, as long as you have a Redis client for it. So let's see how we can use Elixir for this. So now we are still in Ruby land. Here, we overwrite the perform async method which was previously defined in the Sidekick worker. The trick here is to insert a JSON hash into another queue that the Sidekick polar will not look out for. In this example, we are inserting it into queue elixir instead of the queue default. But other than that, the ent entire JSON hash remains the same. We then manually push the JSON into the Redis queue, but, and again this time to the queue that Sidekick is not looking out for. We invoke the worker as per normal. And now, we have an Elixir polar in the background which is looking for jobs, and it's being pushed into Q Elixir. 
Here's roughly how the Elixir Polar looks like. The function poll takes in a process ID of the Redis client and then executes the right pop query on the Elixir queue. It then hands the job over to the worker supervisor, which will then hand over it to a, a worker. It then sleeps for a while and then repeats the entire process of polling. The supervisor will receive a job from the polar, and then it will create a new supervised worker, and hence the job to it. This is how roughly how the worker looks like. The implementation is not really important, but what is important is to see what the worker does to the hash. Let's take a closer look. Here's where we perform a sleight of hand. We, mo we are modifying two things. First, we modify the queue so that it matches the queue that now the psychic polar looks for. So in this case, we are changing the queue back to queue default. But more importantly, the computed result by the Elixir worker is now stored in the arc argument of the hash. Finally, we insert it into the sidekick queue. So the sidekick polar will now pick up the job that we have just inserted. This will call the hard worker class with the arguments that have been previously computed by the Elixir worker. But so much for looking at code. Let me show you a quick demo. So in this demo, I'm going to have three split screens. I'll start Rails console on the top left and on the run sidekick on the bottom left, and on the right-hand side, we're going to run the Elixir Polar. The Elixir worker is going to take a string, upcase it, and simply just reverse the string. So that's pretty much it. Now you have Elixir workers, yet neither Sidekick nor Rails have to have any knowledge of it. So some people I've been speaking to have already started replacing bits of their Rails apps with Elixir apps. I've also briefly like, experimented with creating a distributed key store and replacing it with the Rails cache. There's more to programming than web applications. And I think there are interesting things also currently being done with Elixir and Erlang. For example, you could fly a drone, control a robot arm, and experiment with some parallel programming. But best of all, you don't have to give up Ruby. Matt's made Ruby to optimize for programmer happiness. And I found that Elixir also makes me happy, and I think it can make you happy too. So I'm currently working on a book on Elixir, and if I manage to pique your interest, do check out XOTP book. Com. Well, thanks for listening. Let's have some questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Benjamin. Any questions for him? So I've written a little bit of Erlang before, uh, and certainly coming from Ruby, at first it is an ugly syntax, but you get used to it, right? Um, so I'm just curious, given your perspective from a Ruby background, what are some other things that you feel like are advantages to Elixir versus just learning Erlang itself? I think that's a great question. Um, Syntax-wise, I think coming from Ruby, Elixir looks slightly more palatable. But I found myself, after doing some Elixir, I have to go back to learn Erlang because there's much more documentation and it's a more developed language and already there are many people building things on um, Erlang. So what I've been trying to do is I'm taking some Erlang programs and then converting it back to Elixir. Perspective-wise, I think the tooling around Elixir is getting better, and Elixir is also trying to learn a lot of the mistakes that what Erlang did. Question if I can ask, is there like a facility to use existing Erlang library code from Elixir? Yeah, so that's the, one of the cool things in um, Erlang and Elixir is that you can call Elixir code from Erlang and you can call Erlang code from Elixir. So essentially, you can use any library in Erlang. Thank you. I have a question. Shoot. Um, so have, have you used a um, framework like Celluloid in Ruby? How? 
So yeah, that's an interesting question. So initially, I wanted to learn concurrency stuff because I can't write concurrent programs before. But I found that using Ruby to write concurrent programs isn't really a very good starting point. I started with Celluloid, which is, um, in case you don't know, it's an actor library in written in Ruby. But again, the documentation wasn't like very fantastic. And I didn't see a lot of people really using Celluloid. So I decided to look elsewhere to learn concurrency. Yeah. So there are several other programming languages that have been in development recently around concurrency. Mm -hmm. so why did you choose Alexa over any of these other ones, such as Go or, um, I believe, Clojure just added a bunch of concurrency stuff as well, or, yeah. So um, I tried Haskell, then I, I realized I wasn't that smart. Um, I tried Clojure, but starting the JVM, I mean, doing Rails every day, Rails start, I think I have enough of waiting for the, the JVM to start up. Um, I, I looked at Go briefly, but I didn't really like the syntax. And somehow, when I started with Elixir, everything clicked. I tried Erlang, and again, it didn't work out for me. So uh, I think that Jose Valim has proved himself as a really valuable member of the Ruby community. But what are his credentials as far as programming language creation is concerned that make you feel confident as like it, that you know, he's taking Elixir in a good direction? Good question. The, the, the truth is I don't know. But the fact is I've seen a lot of Erlang people hop on board to Elixir and they're constantly like contributing. And these guys were behind Erlang like 10 years, 20 years. So I'm pretty confident. And the way Jose is handling like all the Elixir in general, he's very open to suggestions. And I think that's really, really nice. Any last questions? Well, if not, thanks, Benjamin. Thank you.